was widely used in the 19th century for the treatment of asthma. And in the 1970s, we found that uh, marijuana uh, has a bronchodilator effect. It's because of the THC in marijuana. First of all, let's contrast, or well, compare and contrast, marijuana with the other, even more widely smoked substance in our society, tobacco. The tobacco was used more widely than any other smoked substance, and marijuana is second only to tobacco. Lucy? Yes, dear? Give me a cigarette, will you, honey? Don't say cigarette, say Philip Morris. Oh? Is there any other kind? Not for you, there isn't. Nothing but the best for Mr. Ricardo. Thank you. Lucy, you're so good to me. You see how easy it is to keep a man happy? Why not give your husband a carton of Philip Morris cigarettes? Smart move. He'll love them for their mildness, their smoothness, and their wonderful good taste. And he'll love you, too, for thinking of them. That's right. Good night, everybody. And don't forget, call for Philip Morris. We know that if you analyze the contents of tobacco and marijuana, they're quite similar. The major difference is that, that, that tobacco contains nicotine, not found in, in marijuana, and marijuana contains THC and about 60 other THC-like substances called cannabinoids, not found in tobacco. But there are other, a lot of other particulates that are shared in common, and these include carcinogens such as Ben's pyrene, the most potent of the carcinogens uh, and considered to be responsible for a large percentage of human cancers. Uh, Ben's pyrene is found in 50% higher concentration in marijuana smoke than in the smoke from a comparable quantity of tobacco. And this has been shown by three separate groups of chemical investigators. So the uh, expectation is that if you smoke marijuana enough and on a regular basis, that you would incur similar risks to smoking tobacco. So what are the major health risks for tobacco? Uh, emphysema, which I prefer to call chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's the new term, it consists of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. But you could have significant impairment in lung function without emphysema, it could just be due to airways disease we call small airways disease, but because we can't separate out the two components of COPD, emphysema, and the airways component, we, we lump them together. So that's COPD. So now COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. and in the world, and will become the third leading cause in 2020. So it's a very important disease. About 120,000 Americans die each year uh, from, uh, from COPD. Probably the best evidence for separating out, uh, the best method for separating out a COPD patient from someone else is to look at the rate of decline in lung function. I shouldn't say the best, it's the, probably the most uh, uh, informative. But it's more difficult to do because you have to make measurements every year for a number of years. And so you get a slope of the rate of loss of lung function over time. We did that. We actually measured lung function every year in uh, our marijuana smokers up, up to eight years. And we found that the slope of the decline in lung function was almost identical in the marijuana only smokers compared to the non-smokers where it was accelerated in the tobacco smokers. So just one other piece of evidence that uh, marijuana is not a risk factor for the development of COPD. I think I'm convinced of that. And the other major health consequence, pulmonary health consequence of tobacco is lung cancer. Cancer is the second most common cause of death uh, in, in the U.S. and lung cancer is the most common form of cancer. And the major risk factor for lung cancer is tobacco smoking. About 160,000 Americans die each year of lung cancer. So the question that came to my mind and that of my colleagues was whether or not there was any evidence that marijuana would at least qualitatively share some of these health risks with those of tobacco. And that uh, was the rationale for initiating our studies back in the 1980s. What is the evidence that marijuana smoking 
habitual marijuana smoking can lead to lung cancer. With respect to the development of lung cancer, uh, we uh, found no evidence of any increased risk of lung cancer uh, occurrence in association with marijuana smoking alone. The marijuana smokers, if anything, had a reduced risk for developing lung cancer. Not a significantly reduced risk, but reduced less than a one-fold, so that means reduced. Whereas the tobacco smokers had a markedly increased risk if uh, th those who smoke more than two packs a day had a 20-fold increase in the risk. That's 2,000 percent. Those who smoke from one to two uh, packs a day uh, had an eight-fold risk. It's 800 percent. Um, so that contrasts with no risk, no increased risk, or any slightly reduced risk with the marijuana smokers. THC actually has an anti-tumoral effect. And uh, these are studies that were done both in experimental animals and in cell culture systems and for different kinds of cancer. For lung cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, gliomas, brain cancer, that the development and growth, or the growth actually of the tumor is, is suppressed by THC and metastases are also suppressed. So how can that be? Well, THC impairs protein synthesis, and it's what we call anti-mitogenic or anti-proliferative. You need, so tumor cells don't as readily proliferate in the presence of THC. They're also uh, anti-angiogenic, so they interfere with the growth and development of new blood vessels that are necessary for metastatic spread. And they also are pro-apoptotic. What is apoptosis? Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So. When cells age, there is a mechanism whereby the cells die. Uh, it's a non-necrotic death to die off the old cells and the, we get rid of them before they have an opportunity to develop mutations that would lead to cancer. So enhancing apoptosis diminishes the risk of the cells becoming cancerous. So marijuana turns out, THC rather, turns out to be pro-apoptotic. So those appear to be the mechanisms that might account for these anti-tumoral effects of THC. We decided to do our own case control study. Funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is a major funding agency for marijuana-related research. This was the largest study uh, ever conducted on this subject. It was very well designed. We used the uh, Los Angeles uh, Tumor Registry to identify, rapidly ascertain all the cases of lung cancer and head and neck cancer <clears throat> that occur, that were diagnosed in the LA County system. And uh, of course, by the time we got to some of them, they'd already died or were too sick, but we got to it, over 60% of them who agreed to participate and uh, were able to participate. And we administered this questionnaire. And then we matched them to controls, the uh, same age, socioeconomic status, that lived in the same neighborhood, using an algorithm that USC developed for this purpose so that we could match, you know, we're comparing apples with apples. And then we administered the, this detailed questionnaire, the food frequency questions, occupational history, all kinds of things. We also did molecular uh, we got uh, a buckle smear so we could look at the DNA, could look at the genetics of lung cancer. Uh, so what we did was to recruit uh, uh, smokers, heavy smokers of marijuana, um, at least uh, join a day for a week. And it ended up that the average smoker of marijuana whom we recruited smoked three joints a day for about 15 years. and. Um, uh, that's true. We also required that they smoke that much for five years, but on the average they smoked three joints for 15 years. So that's about 45 to 50 joint years. A joint year is, is the number of joints smoked uh, times the number of years smoked. Over the study population was, I think, be between 35 and 59. I think 35 was a young age group. Which we thought that they had to be uh, teenagers are in their early 20s at the time of the 
at least in the marijuana epidemic, which you know was in the, in the mid 60s. So prior to that time, very few people used marijuana, but after that time, it just mushroomed up to 1979, which represented actually the apex, the acme of use of marijuana in our society. So that, we, that's why we chose those age limits. And so what did we find? Uh, for any category of cannabis use, including heavy use, heavy use we define as more than 10 joint years, but we looked at 20 joint years and 30 joint years. For every category of marijuana use, the ratio was less than one, meaning reduced risk. It wasn't significantly reduced, but it was reduced. With, uh, and the confidence intervals were not that, that wide. Uh, around the point estimate. So there was no evidence, and we controlled for all the known or putative factors, uh, close for socioeconomic status, can comment, tobacco smoking, alcohol, etc. At the same time, when we did a similar analysis for the tobacco smokers, there was a huge effect of tobacco. medicine that patients themselves can grow. For people with cancer who may be facing, thinking about the end of their life, to be able to grow a plant and work in the garden and, and produce their own medicine is very empowering and, and something that, you know, I think does the patient a lot of good. Marijuana is illegal and the government doesn't sponsor this kind of research. Now, in view of the fact that large numbers of people are using marijuana medicinally, I think it's a shame that uh, there is no investment in this kind of research. I think there's a very bright future for medical cannabis in this country. I grew up around drugs, but to me, drugs are a good thing. I walked into a building or went into a building every day, almost, of my first 18 years had had a 13 foot tall sign that said drugs. My father was a pharmacist and we sold medication uh, and the, as far as I'm concerned medication is helpful for people. I don't think that medication has a personality. It sits on the shelf until uh, you prescribe it for somebody. Uh, it has beneficial uses and has side effects and it should only be used when necessary.